Today on the podcast, we have Amanda Klatt, and it's all about UTMB. UTMB, to me, the course, even in light of the new Walmsley documentary, is still shrouded in a little bit of secrecy. And I don't think that that's anyone's fault. And maybe it's just me as, you know, as a fan of that race, um, missing some of the key components when I, when I consume the, you know, the coverage of it and all that sort of stuff. You hear the aid stations, you hear the total vert, like 33,000, something like that feet of gain. Um, but it doesn't always hit, doesn't always land on me. And so I thought that'd be fun to do a, a whole episode where we talk about the course, we talk about the aid stations, what makes European aid stations unique from the United States? What, what is UTMB? Like what is, what makes it such a highly coveted race to get into? Uh, what we don't get into is all the controversy of it from the last year. Not really what you're here for. Um, not really within my scope of expertise to address. There's been lots of awesome people out there who've, who've addressed it from both sides of the the spectrum, from all sides of the spectrum, I should say. Uh, but that's just not what we do today. We talk about all the stuff that makes it fun. It makes it desirable with Amanda, who ran it last year, uh, crushed it, and, uh, you know, lived to tell, lived to tell the tale. So before we get into that, though, with Amanda, I just wanted to let you know, real quick about Wilder making progress there. We're in this phase right now where I just really, really need your feedback. Um, even if you don't use the app, in fact, especially if you don't use the app, it's helpful. But if you do, there's plenty there for you as well. Um, for our tequila highway event that we have coming up, I'm going to let you run that with us for free, normally 20 bucks. If you take that three minute survey, I'm going to have the link in the show notes and it's the link in bio on our Instagram and all, all of those fun places. But it's just helping us guide and, and steer that thing. And th- this survey isn't about how it could be better as is. This is about the future of it and where it's going and really wanting your input on what we're thinking about where it's going. All right, without any further ado, this is my friend Amanda talking about a UTM. All right, season three of the DFL Before DNF podcast. My name is Josh Rosenthal, Borderlands Trail Running. Um, today, as we're in season three and we're looking at the new, I don't know, let's say the new season where we're, we're talking about courses, we're hitting some of the popular ones, but we also, I, I also have every intention of digging into small sub 100 person races around the country and around the world. Um, Episode one was Cocodona with Joe Corsion and, and a, an awesome conversation about what will be an iconic, maybe already an iconic race, but what, what certainly seems to be poised to be, uh, you know, the UTMB of 250 milers um, or, or the 200 mile world um, as it grows. And, and, you know, Joe's just a delightful person to talk to about that. Um, today, we're going to we're going to do a bit of a deep dive. Uh, but from a personal take, which is what I was, which is what I want to try to do. I'm not trying to bring an academic understanding of UTMB, but today we're going to do a uh, a deep dive into UTMB through a friend of mine who we actually we talked in person for the first time today. But we've just been engaged in the ultra running community through Instagram, um, and she's ran UTMB. She she has a deep connection to Chamonix, and so I think just to bring perspective, I've I've, I've I think about UTMB the same way I think about the Barkley marathons that I know it's hard. I hear it's hard. Um, but with Barkley, I see that Jared Campbell seems to know how to finish the thing quite often. Um, I see Jim Walmsley get 19 and a half hours at UTMB, but the cutoff is still over 40 hours. So, and it's a massive race. So what are all of those other people who aren't Jim Walmsley and Courtney Dowalter? What are they out there doing and what's it like? And what, what's the actual course what's happening out there? And what's it like to go through a town and, you know, do you actually eat food or just aid station food? So I have all these questions today for my friend, Amanda. So Amanda, welcome to the DFL Before DNF podcast. Thanks for taking the time to be with me. Thanks for inviting me. It's fun to be here. I'm super yeah. excited. I love UTMB, so I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah, let, let's just go right in here at the first and, and we'll, uh, on, on the course itself, because even though I've been to the race, it's I can't go access various points of it it's it's a they don't want just the spectators it, you know crew can go out there but you know you've ran it how many times have you ran it let's start there um i've only run utmb once but i did also okay. run cc which is the 100k and okay. occ so i've yep. been on various parts of the course a couple times nice 
So w- what's it like? I mean, okay, I'm standing on the road and I'm about like half a mile down on the road and it's just jam packed with people. And that starting line, you've got, you probably, you, you're probably running twice as fast as you want to because the energy is so exciting from all the people cheering you on. As soon as you get out of sight from me on the road, like w- what are you doing at UTMB? W- when are you hitting the trail? W- what's that first little stretch like? So there's like six to eight miles of kind of flat-ish road before you're hitting like the real trails in the mountains. And then kind of from then on, it's just these relentless climbs. And it's really interesting being an American, I think, be running a European race because the descents are so steep. Like I feel like I'm pretty good at climbing, but it's like they don't yeah. believe in switchbacks over there. So you climb this hill and then you're just oh. going down these really steep descents like over and over i think there's 33,000 feet you know and so you're just climbing these massive hills and i'm not i'm a better climber than i am downhill and i feel like you know the europeans because they're just bombing down those hills and i'm like i'm losing time on the really? downhills and they're some of the trails are pretty technical they're rocky um there's lots of routes there's a ton of people which is nice i like running with people i get motivation mm-hmm. and, and you know encouragement from their people. I think some people don't like those bigger races, but I like seeing the people, um, the other runners. I like running through all the towns and having the spectators. There are several little towns that you run through. Like the first night, it starts at 6 p.m. I don't know how many people know that. So you run kind of, you run through two nights unless you're really fast, then you only have to run through, run through one. <laughs> um, but what I what I love about this so the, is that this is the one of the few races where elites have to go overnight because it starts at 6 p.m. Usually, you know, an elite may not even yeah. see a sunset. They'll see a sunrise and maybe not a sunset. What I love about this is it's a really great equalizer among the elites and the, you know, the non-elites. Like we all have to struggle through the night in that race. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, I do think it's fun. And I think because you start, I think it's at 6. The first night wasn't too hard for me because you're just amped up. You know, you're excited and you do start when it's light. Yeah. And then as soon as it gets dark, there's some pretty big climbs that first night and you can just look up. I mean, you feel like you're looking up into outer space and you just see this trail of headlamps, Mm -hmm. which is really cool to see. But also you're like, oh my gosh, I have so much (laughs) further to go on this hill. (laughs) The top is not where I thought it was. Um, But yeah, so just like a lot of big climbs um, halfway through, I think... After there's like this big aid station halfway through and there's this, it felt like to me a massive climb afterward. And I just wasn't expecting that, even though, you know, you stare at the course map, but I, I feel like Hmm. you just know, you're just going to go up to go back down. (laughs) Yeah. So that, that's interesting. I mean, when, when you're training for that, I mean, what I've heard and I've never ran in the San Juans either. I've heard the closest thing we have in America is the San Juans. Do you, are you, how are you training are thinking about those, you know, bombing down hills or is it just, there's no way yeah, to really train. Not, I don't think there's a great way. I could have done better. So I'm in Park City, Utah, and there is a hill, mm. well, in Salt Lake, it's called West Granger, which is really steep. I think it's like 3,200 feet and like two miles. Um, so the oh, uphill is wow. good, but the downhill, I think, mimics some of the downhills in France. They're not quite as steep. But it's a good, you know, there's like no switchbacks. You're going straight down. It's kind of rocky. So I wish I would have done that more. I think it would have helped. Like, And I just think focusing more on being faster and more comfortable running in technical downhills would have helped me. But it is hard. Mm. We just don't have – the mountains are just so different. Yeah. Here and in um, France and Italy. Well, when we were chatting before, you mentioned – something I didn't know that I think is really interesting. So when you're running that, and I didn't even notice this, you're saying that uh, the flag of whatever country the the runner is from is is on your back, like a small version of it. Is is that right? Yeah. So when you check in and you get your number, so you get your bib that you have to wear like around your waist or wherever you want to wear your bib. And then they give you like a little zip tie with your flag. And most people put it on the back of their packs. So it's really nice. It's nice as a runner because if you're coming up to other runners, you know, if they're from the U.S. or countries that might speak English, you know, versus maybe not. So yeah. you're like, can we can we converse? And then it was really cool running through all the oh, towns. I was amazed at, yeah, um, I was amazed at the spectators, how much they paid attention to that. Like so many people would yell, go USA or, you know, whatever wow. nationality. And then you feel more connected to the crowd. And it was also fun 
Um, I don't know the ratio. I know I've looked at it for UTMB, like men versus women, but I do mm. think it's fun. Like anytime I would come to towns, they would say, Alefi, Alefi, like go girl, which I thought was just really cool. And that they recognized that it wasn't just go. They took the extra step to be like, oh, you're doing this. So good for you. You're a woman. You've got this. <laughs> That's awesome. So it's just kind Do of you, fun. Here's like, so as a stereotype, because, uh, you know, someone I've been to France quite a bit and we're, my family's actually moving to France in July. Oh, that is amazing. We, we have this sort of perception. Like you of are? Like, um, that maybe they don't, uh, uh, you know, that they don't like Americans or Americans are loud. Uh, and we very much are loud, but when we're actually there and interacting, you know, like I I just, I feel like there's just, there's such an, an affection for one another, even though yes, we're bringing our culture and they're bringing their culture. And so what I like to hear from you is to say that you're wearing the American flag and people are also being kind to you and supportive of you. And, you know, I think some of the, the stereotypes of, you know, the French and American tension are, are just outright incorrect. And so I just love to hear you say that, like, as an American with the American flag on your back, you're also getting cheered for and shouted for and, and people are encouraging and, and stuff like that. Yeah, they were really supportive. And we have been going over to France for several years. And I don't know if uh-huh. it's the difference between, you know, being in Paris as like a big town versus Chamonix is a pretty small mm-hmm. mountain town and, you know, just differences. Yeah. But people have always been so warm and welcoming. And I also think... I mean, it's a little different in the race because you're not really interacting with people. But I think as long as you're starting conversation with like, bonjour, even if you don't know any other French, just that they know that they're trying. I think that goes a long ways. Yeah. So, yeah, that's awesome. I've had great experience. So as you're moving along. Yes. Yeah. And me too. And there's just, it's just the, to me, it's just the stereotypes that I want to every chance I can to at least, at least name them and say that, hey, there's some misunderstanding. Maybe there's some. There's obviously cultural differences. I like the cultural differences, but in the end, they're a very um, supportive and very kind uh, group of people, you know, that I've interacted with over there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what are what are aid stations like at UTMB? I mean, is there any sort of Frenchness or Italianness or Switzerlandness, <laughs> Swissness? Yes. Um, to the I, aid stations? I love the aid stations at UTMB. I think... Some people don't, but you walk in and they just have this whole table. They have a ton of different cheeses. They have salami and meats. They have chocolate. They have pasta and rice and soups. And oh I I try to eat as much real food as I can at aid stations. And for whatever reason, I'm always able to eat the food there. Like it always just sounds good. Um, not mm-hmm. always the meats, but like the cheese and the pastas. And I've had a great experience today. <laughs> I don't know. You just feel so like, of course, this is how an aid station should be in Europe. Like I should be yes. getting chocolate and cheese. And I love the aid stations there. So yeah, I have is no there, complaints. Is there the typical, and I like, well, Swedish fish and M and M's is that there too? No, not really. They have they have like the little pieces of chocolates, but they don't have as much of like the more processed type foods that we think of oh, that's um, at aid stations, amazing. Yeah. which is nice and not nice. I actually, I do better with more salty foods the more I run because I think in between aid stations, I'm eating more of like the goos, which oh, yeah. are just yeah, more point. sweet. So by the time I'm there, I'm like, I need something that has no sugar in it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but yeah, they yeah. have good chocolate, no Swedish fist, but good chocolate and Coca-Cola, which that's hilarious. That's, that's great. all you need, right? Okay, nice. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. So what do you know, like off the top of your head, like the first aid station, second aid station, like uh, what, w- when are you hitting Italy? When is Cormayor? Like some of the stuff that we all hear, we hear Cormayor, but are there aid stations in between yeah, that are so, notable or memorable for you? Yeah. So one of the first aid stations is after, It's. I wish I knew the names, but I think it's probably around mile like Sorry. eight. It's kind of after you leave the um, mm-hmm. the flat road and are into the hills. And it's fun because yeah. I think there was just some like fluid there, but it's just amazing how many spectators there are. And pe- it's a really big event. People mm. are there cheering you on. Um, and then mm. there's a couple more aid stations before Cormier. Cormier is about halfway through. So it's about 52 ish miles. Oh. And it's okay. Yeah. It's a yeah. massive aid station. It's in this big like sports, sports center in Italy. And that's where you have, there's, 
only one drop bag for UTMB and it gets, you get to have it at Cormier. Um, so that's interesting. I think wow. the Europeans just, they race different. Um, yeah. yeah, you just get the one drop bag. And I think there's three aid stations where you can have assistance. Um, hmm. but they do a good job. Like the little aid stations. I remember the morning, the first morning, like my first sunrise, I was probably, I don't know, like 10 miles away from Cormier. There's at the bottom of this hill, there's this tiny little aid station and you're in this like mountain scene and there's waterfalls coming down and the sun is rising and you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm here. I'm doing this. And all these cute Italian people, you know, just trying to help you and not speaking like the best English, but being so nice. And <laughs> right. yeah, they do a great job with the aid stations. And yeah, I remember getting to Cormier. Cormier was a hard aid station because it's at the, it's at a ski, the base of the ski hill, but there's a really steep descent okay. into it. And it's like, you can see it, but you feel uh, so far away. You're like, my quads oh, hurt so that. bad. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm so close, yeah. but so far. <laughs> do, do you think um, the one but, drop, the one drop bag thing is because of like, be, like they're going to take care of you on the course or is it just like, Hey, you know, too many drop, you, you know, the, carry what you need in your pack. You can have one drop bag, but the eight stations are sufficient. Or, or, or what do you make of the one drop bag thing? Cause I just ran Zion hundred miler and I had like yeah. seven drop bags. Yeah. And I, I've run similar races where it's like every time I can have a drop bag, I put it. So I was nervous going yeah. into it, you know, but knew my husband was like crewing me. So knew he was going to meet me at the other ones, but you have to carry so much stuff for UTMB. They have all this mandatory gear. I mean, I think my pack weighed yeah. like 10 plus pounds. And so I think they're just like, you are supposed oh. to have the gear. And, um, yeah, so I was nervous, but it ended up being okay. When I was running, I never felt like I wish I had another drop bag, which is kind of nice to run in like a more simplistic way, you know? And I also think you yeah. use less time at aid stations if you're not running to grab a drop bag. Oh, uh, but- that's fair. Yeah. But yeah, so much yeah, stuff. What, what, when what I was like make, packing my bag, what makes up like, that ten pounds? What what is it? So you have to carry two headlamps and extra batteries. You have to carry a very specific like waterproof jacket, and then you also need to have waterproof pants, and you need another layer of pants and shirt, and then you have to have a specific amount of water, a certain amount of nutrition. You have to have like a kit with wow. band aids and other stuff in it. I can't remember. And I tried to buy like really light stuff because I've had a couple of people that I know that have run UTMB and they're like, oh, you can get away with using like this versus this. But they do check. So mm-hmm. when you get your bib, they check to oh. make sure that you have all the mandatory gear. And then a little okay. after Cormier, it was the second night, there's a huge aid station called Champagne Lock. And they checked okay. too. And if you don't have your gear, they make you sit out. So you can't dump gear either. It's not like oh, at Cormier, wow. you're like, okay, I'm going to dump like half my gear. Yeah. They check again. And if you don't have it, like you're penalized. So they're very, wow. you know, very strict about that. So I think between that and like the aid stations I thought were pretty good. I never in a good way was wanting more drop bags. Yeah. I mean, are but they yeah, doing that same sort of regulation for Walmsley and Katie Scheid and everybody who's up front? Is it, I mean, is that for everybody? <laughs> I don't know. I've supposedly they are, but I don't know. They say that they are, that everyone has to carry. I also yeah. don't know if they get different like crew type stuff. I'm not totally sure, but they, I mean, they definitely had packs on that had mm, stuff in yeah. them. I don't think they looked as heavy as mine or other people's, yeah. but maybe they're just better at packing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's entirely <laughs> possible. Um, it was interesting though. So, so I had heard she- at one, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, that no, you're, you're supposed to carry an extra pair of pants. And so people oh. would put nylon like tights because they're super light and count that as their pants. Mm. But they were really strict this year and they were taking those out and telling people that they did not count because if like the weather went bad or wow. something, like that's not going to save you. But people mm. did try to do things like that. And I think in the past, maybe they've gotten away with it. But they, at least this year, they were kind of cracking down and saying, no, you have to have like real pants in case you need them, yeah. not nylon stockings. <laughs> well, here's a very ignorant question 
um, again, of someone who's been there even, I just haven't studied the course is so, I mean, I know that you're, you're going around UTMB. You're never a, you're never going up it. Correct. And B, can you see mm-hmm. it? I mean, if, if it were sun sunny the whole time, are you really able to see it the whole time? Is it, is that what it's like? Not the whole time, but definitely like after Cormier, there's this pretty significant climb. And when you get to the top of that, you have like unobstructed views. Like mm-hmm. it is so beautiful. That's the, the upside yeah. and the downside of UTMB is everywhere you look, there's like 360 views. But also I feel like there comes a certain point where you're just like, mm. I need to finish one foot in the front of the other that you kind of stop taking it in. So I would love to go back one day and do it over several days just to really see all the scenery because mm. it really is a beautiful race. Yeah. And also the first night, I know like we were pretty close to some glaciers because you could tell and it was like a little snowy the first night I was running, but but you can't totally see them. And you're like, I know this is so beautiful, but mm-hmm. it's nighttime, so I can't see it right now. So, but yeah, amazing views. And you can't mm-hmm. always yeah, see Mont Blanc, but I've there heard, are definitely I've heard... parts. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, definitely parts where you can I, see I've it. I've heard and... that if you hike it, it takes like, you know, people will do it for like seven to nine days or something like that. Like. Uh, for, for reference, like you, you're, you're running it in, you know, 30, 40 hour range, but if people are actually going to hike this trail and do it justice to see all the beauty that you're talking about here, I mean, they'll, they'll do it across seven days, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of, it's fun. Cause even when you're running the course, you can see all these little huts that people can stay at if they're hiking the course. And we actually saw a fair amount of backpackers oh, like coming yes. out of the hikes, I mean, that. out of the huts. So yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. fun to see all those people. Have you done, have you ever stayed in the hut before? No, I would love to. I need, I need to get over and do that. I've only just run. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's the, the, the hut piece is the, the thing I, that I would love to see over here in America. It just from what I understand, I don't know if you rent them out or how you get to, but I had some friends in this, this program that I was doing in Paris that were like, yeah, we're, we're just, we're just going to go spend the next four or five days in the Alps. We're just going to be running the whole time. I'm like, what are you, are you like, you're going to be running and are you going to be sleeping? Like, yeah, but we're just going to stay in the huts along the way. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So you can just go run, you know, over there for 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers. And then you get to a hut and then you can just stay at the hut and eat and enjoy yourself and then run to another hut the next day over the course of, you know, another 50 kilometers. It's, it's sounds just incredible. I know. I, I think last summer there's a program that I've looked at through like online and Instagram called run the Alps and they do. Yeah, that's exactly what they do. And I'm always like, why do I keep signing up for these races when I could enjoy it more if I just went hut to hut? And I, yeah. And I think they can, even if you sign up with certain companies, they'll carry all your stuff for you. So you really just get to like run, which I'm like, wow, that's so, yes. that'd be such a neat experience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, the, to the contrast that with what you go, go through in the race, like the, the amount of suffering that you go through to get through UTMB combined with, you know, contrasted with the huts. I mean, tell me about like by the numbers, you know, UTMB, it's what, maybe it's like 106 miles and, and how much gain is it? And I mean, just kind of, kind of give me a, an overview of, of what the suffering of UTMB is like from the runner's yeah. perspective. So yeah, it's 106 miles, 33,000 feet of elevation gain and probably about the same loss. Um, and I think the second night is so hard. Like it's really hard to run through two nights and, yeah. um, I think just the mountains are so big and it's kind of a little bit demoralizing the second half. Like there were several times, I mean, you know, you've run ultras, like we have all these thoughts. You're like, how much do I really want to finish this? (laughs) You know, I've come this far. And especially me, because I have ran the back half of the course a couple of times. I'm like, I know how this goes, you know, like I've seen it now. I've like essentially done the whole loop, not at the same time, but there were so many moments where, I mean, you just have to tell yourself all these things like one of my big motivating factors was, you know, I have two small kids and training for these events takes so much time away from them, you know, trying to juggle it all. And then I also work. And so I, and they were there. And so I just remember thinking like, I have to finish for them because they're here and they're young enough to know that I know to like, 
they don't understand all the intricacies of like, oh, if you don't finish, but you still try, you know? And I was like, I, it just took so much yeah, time right. <laughs> away from them. Like all they know is that all summer I was either like running or working and I can't have like yeah. come over here and like not finish. So I hit yeah. a really low point after Cormier. I actually felt really great the first 50 miles. And then, I don't know, there was yeah. just this massive climb after. And I was like, I don't know, like, you have to dig deep because you're like, how much do I feel? Like, how much do I really want to finish this? You know, we all have those highs and lows, but it's interesting the conversations that you have with yourself in that moment and like what keeps you Mm. going. But it is, I do think the people help a lot. Like I'm motivated by people. I know people, other people aren't and like my husband runs a little bit and he's like, I want to like run by myself. I don't want to talk to anybody. I just like want to get it done. And I'm like, no, give me all the people, (laughs) all the friends. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> nice. Yeah. And c- can you have pacers? Uh, did I, I can't recall you saying anything about that. Do you get a pacer? No, no pacers, which is also wow. hard. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know if yes. it's a European thing or just a UTMB thing, you know, cause it's so common mm. in us to have pacers and fun, you know, you see those people, yeah. but it was nice to see yeah. my husband at those, like the, I think it's like three aid stations that he could come to. And I did meet, yeah. I ended up linking up with a couple different people along the run that just like really helped. So that's always nice. Mm. But yeah, no pacers, which is yeah. a bummer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that was going to be my question. Maybe it's because the course is so dense with people because they allow so many people to run it. So you're never, maybe, maybe you're never like, if you don't want to be, you don't have to be alone. But one of my issues is that running in the dark of night is is really, you know, it's a psychological you know, maybe I'm afraid of the dark. So having somebody to get me through the sunset is really helps me psychologically. So going into it, is there a psychological component to knowing that you're either going to have to make a friend or you're going to be alone? Like, does that, does that mess with you at all in a race like this? Yeah, it, it totally does because I, I mean, I'm 35 and I hate the dark. I'm totally scared of the dark. I've been my whole life. Okay, good. I feel so good, dumb admitting too. that. I feel, I feel like, more comfortable now. <laughs> I don't want to like run it. Like anytime I hear a leaf rustle, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's Same. a bear or a mountain lion. Yes. Um, but <laughs> the nice thing I told myself a lot about UTMB is that in a very interesting way, they don't have any like mountain predators. They have like mountain goats. You know, there's no coyotes sure? or bears or mountain lions. Yeah, they don't really huh. have any of those. So at least from that, I was like, okay, at least from like an animal standpoint, I'm yeah. safe. I was made for the Alps. Um, yeah. I know that I was like, that's where we need to retire. My husband wants to retire in West Yellowstone mm-hmm. and they have grizzly bears. I'm like, no, it's the wrong place. <laughs> oh yeah. No, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I wasn't as worried going into the first night because I had heard that there were, there's so many people that you would always see somebody, um, which was too, I mean, some of the hikes we were on, it's just like this steady stream of people. So you're never alone. It starts to get a little more dispersed, but you can always see people, which is nice and comforting for me. Yeah. And also in a good way, there's only one real trail. You know, some races you run and you have to navigate more or it's like, did I miss the flag? But Mm. it's very obvious where you're supposed to go, which makes me feel better too because I'm the worst navigator also. Absolutely. Like I would last 10 seconds at Barkley Marathons because I can't navigate. Yeah. At the the Zion 100, Uh, there was a – stretch of the trail that was uh it was so windy that it kind of messed up the course markings and you know everybody oh, was adding I added I added two miles to my race and there were some some people that we talked to that added five miles to the race just getting lost up on this plateau. What is uh I mean is European course marking any different? I mean that's kind of a silly question, but is it just little ribbons tied to trees or is it is it different or is there signage? I mean what's with it being more developed over there? There I'm were some they have, uh, signs I don't rem- – it's funny. Like it hasn't been that long. It hasn't even been a year, but I'm foggy. I'm, I don't remember there really being flags. I feel like there were some signs if like you had to turn one way, like at a fork. Mm. But it – in like said, in a great way, there's really like one path. <laughs> so – yeah. and there was always, I think, enough people that you could see in front of you that you were like, okay, I think that's mm. the right way. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I don't remember really course flags. Now I'm curious. I'm going to have to go back and I was yeah, going to say look at my photos. pictures, but I'm very yeah. anti-phone when I run. Like it's really – I just want to like focus. I don't want to see like text message people are sending me or like 
take very many videos. Yeah. And so I don't have a lot of pictures or videos yeah. from the course because like mentally I'm like, that's too much for me to handle. I'm, I just have to put yeah. one foot in front of the other and that's all I can think about. Yeah. Man, I'm, I'm totally the same. I, so, I don't like to have, I always have my phone on airplane mode. Even if I have reception, I'll, I'll turn it back on occasionally, but by and large, I want to be so separated from the normal world. The last thing I want is like a buddy texting me, asking me, you know, something related to our business or something like that. Like I just, I want to be so disconnected. And then I also add on top of that to be in, you know, circumventing uh, Mont Blanc. I mean, it's just like that, that sort of like lostness and isolation, which is funny because I, on one hand, I'm scared of the dark. On the other hand, I want to be so isolated sometimes that, you know, I can't hear or see a single person. Um, that that's why I yeah. think this race is like the epitome of that in some ways to me. I think too, just ultras in general, you learn about yourself in a way that you can't otherwise. And I think yeah. even thinking of like doing the huts versus doing the UTMB and getting it all done, like very different yeah. experiences. But I feel like when you're in that place of suffering and like having to go and really disconnectedness from everywhere, that's where you really find yourself and learn about yourself. And, you know, you have yeah. all that interesting and weird internal dialogue, which I think sometimes is what always brings me back to the races. Like that's what we crave in a world where we're just so busy and at any second of every day you have emails and texts. And, you know, even thinking yesterday, I picked up my kids from the school and they wanted to go to the park. And I was like, we have to go home. My phone is only at 7%. So I've got to charge it quick before we go. <laughs> and I'm like, why am I this person? Like what emergency, but we're just trained to think that way. But in ultra, yeah. it's like, we're given permission to check out, which I love. Yes. And yes. especially in a place, Same. you know, that's beautiful and like we have a really deep connection over there. So just kind of everything you're like, oh my gosh, I want to try to be in the moment mm -hmm. as much as possible, even yeah. if I'm really suffering. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Actually, last night I was hanging out with my buddies who went with me to Chamonix last year to watch the race. And like earlier in the week before we hung out, one guy sends a picture to us of just, you know, us sitting in Chamonix. And, you know, the question becomes like, did, did that really happen? Like that's my, that's my least favorite thing about international travel is that when I come back, it's like, you know, it's like a time warp and I'm back and I think, did that really just happen? And I wonder, the question last night that I asked was what, what can we do different in these moments that when we look at the photos, we don't question whether or not we were there. That's just like, how do you be so fully present in those moments? You know, and I think ultras like you're saying, pull you in. So I wasn't running, but the, like when I think of Zion, it's so, it's all I'm doing. My phone's off. Only thing I'm doing is moving forward and running uh, or, you know, gosh, very little running, unfortunately, actually, uh, you know, oh, stumbling forward. There, there was very little running for me the last half of UTMB too. Don't worry. I, fi I figured, <laughs> but when with four, with 40, what'd you say? 42,000 or how much, how much gain did you say? 33,000. 33 with 33,000, yeah. there's just not a lot of time to run in there. I mean, with that up and down, I'm not running on a lot of that down either. So, the, I mean, is there ever no. like how much flat, how much time are you getting to just kind of have a good, I don't know, 10 there's, to 14 minute pace? Yeah. There's a great, after that climb on Cormier that I've talked about, there's probably like, mm -hmm. I think it's 10 ish miles. It's like oh. one of the very few parts of the course that has like nice windy switchbacks that you can run at like a yeah. really nice grade. Um, so mm. that is really nice. And then also the ending. So it's pretty steep coming down from Flagere is the very last aid station and town I think is four miles. And after mm. you're like a mile when you get off the trail and you just get to run through town and it's flat. And I think that's one of the coolest moments. I don't know. I, I'm like, I don't know if the start line or the finish line is cooler, but that is one of those like flat mm. moments and the streets are just lined with yeah. people and you're just like, yeah. oh my gosh, I actually did this. Yeah. But yeah, 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 not a, not a lot of running. There, there are definitely some flat places, <laughs> but sometimes you get to the flats and you're like, my legs are so beat up. Like I can't even, my legs don't even run anymore. They just walk. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, I get, I get that. Hel help me understand. Okay. So if, for those who, you, who aren't familiar with the race and they're still hanging this far into the discussion, are familiar with it. UTMB is France to Italy, Switzerland, back to mm -hmm. France. Um, Cormayor is the, Ital the big Italy aid station is Champaillac. Is that Switzerland? Yes. Champaillac is Switzerland. And that's okay. the biggest, um, that's probably the next biggest aid station. 
Uh-huh. And um, it's a great aid station. It's hard because you've kind of been on this nice long descent from Italy, you know, kind of all day and you're winding through. There's like one more big climb in between that, but mm-hmm. one of the nicer sections of the course. And then, you know, you're getting close to Champagne Lock and there's like a thousand foot climb to get there. And you can see the lights at this cute little like city and you can see the lights just at the top of this hill. And you're like, oh my gosh, I've got to get there. But mm-hmm. There's this really pretty lake. Um, and then once you leave Champe Lock, you have a series of like three pretty big climbs, just like one right after another. But at the base of each one of those climbs, there are some pretty good aid stations, which is nice. But hmm. those are some of the hmm. steepest climbs in the race are like these last three. And it's just like straight up, straight down, aid stations, straight up, straight down, aid stations. Yeah. So it's hard. Where? And it's hard. So one. Oh, go ahead. oh sorry. I was going to say the second climb, I think, is one of the steepest. It's not as long as some of the other ones, but you're moving so, at least I was moving pretty slow at that point. I mean, I don't know grades because I'm not good at like numbers like that, but it's so steep. You can't move that fast up. And I would think it was like midnight of the first or the second night. And I was like falling asleep as I'm walking up this hill because I was like, I'm moving too slow to keep myself awake and I'm so tired. But I was like trying to chew the caffeine gum and like all these things. I was like, <laughs> got to snap out of this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you do those three climbs and the last climb is actually the one that takes you up to Flagere, which is the very mm. last aid station and you can see town. And it's like that oh, moment where you're cool. like, Oh my gosh, I did this. I'm going to make it. Yeah. yeah. And then you just get a run down and then to town. So mm. how, it's a, how yeah, far a great is it from course that, from Flagere. I think it's about four miles, so okay. and it, it's the longest four miles of your life. <laughs> yeah, totally. Because in your mind, you're like, I feel like I it's it. downhill. <laughs> I did it, yeah. Um, but there's this one, like, right, the aid station is, like, at the ski hill mid-station. And so then it's, like, mm. this really sh- steep downhill that's, like, not even on a trail. It's, like, a fire road almost. And then mm. the downhill is really... Um, it's really windy. There's tons of roots, tons of rocks. You just and you feel like every, with every turn, you're like, I should be closer. And then it, you're still looking out over, over the view, and you're like, town does not seem like it's that close. And then, last thing about this, so right after you get off the trail from um, mm-hmm. the mountains, and you're about to go into the street to Chamonix to the finish line, there's a street you have to cross, and they've put these mm-hmm. stairs and a bridge to go uh-huh. over. And it's like, you get down and you're like, my legs are so shot. And you see these stairs and you're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to climb these stairs to cross this road? <laughs> Can't we just walk across the road? And I've now done this crossing three times because all the races for the UTMB races, they all end at the same uh, place. In there. And yeah. this year for UTMB, you know, where most of us are going like up and over these stairs, like, oh my gosh, you've got to be kidding me. And I see a runner just run across the street. And I was like, you can do that? Is that allowed? Like all these years I've been going up and down these stairs and he just (laughs) ran right across the street. So I felt like ripped off. I don't know, but I don't know. I was like, maybe if I do it again, I'm just going to walk across the street instead of walking up the stairs. Yes. Oh man, that's hilarious. Uh, Where are the cows at? Aren't there there some, some cows that you have to run past at some point? Oh, they're kind of everywhere. I feel like they were... Everywhere along the course after Cormier, you see a lot of cows. And it's interesting because they like legit have those cowbells. But also everyone along the course oh, really? when they're cheering you on have cowbells. So oh. I remember the first time I was <laughs> rounding this corner, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so close to the aid station. I can hear the cowbells. And I round this corner and it was cows with the cowbells <laughs> on. And I was so like disheartened. I was like, so deflated, oh my gosh, yeah. it's the cows. It's not the aid yeah. station, but yeah, I, uh, the cows were always like a little off the trail for me, but I've heard some crazy stories where they're following people or they're on the trail. They were always like a little <laughs> off to me, but just the cowbells. Like I very distinctly remember that thinking like, I really thought it was the aid station and it's cows because <laughs> when have you seen a cow that. with a cowbell on in the U S like I never have. So well, yeah, so many me- funny things think a little bit of like hallucination but you weren't hallucinating uh that was just it was a real sound and then you see that it's just a sound coming from something that you weren't expecting were you hallucinating at all in this like my last hundred i i i I generally love the hallucinating 
I hallucinated so much that I was <laughs> like, I was in a panic, like freak out. Did you, did you have many hallucinations on this one or do you ever hallucinate? Um, I didn't on this one during the race. I don't hallucinate a lot. I ran the bear 100 like two years ago. And that was the first time uh-huh. that I was hallucinating. Like I was seeing, I thought trees were people and things. This one I didn't hallucinate yeah. until after. Oh. It was really interesting. Oh. Like after when we got back and I was like getting in the shower and stuff, I was like, I am losing my mind. Like I'm seeing things and mm. I'm hearing things. And I feel like my senses were just totally distorted. And it was weird because you expect it on the course. And it was mm-hmm. after I was like, I just have to like lay down and close my eyes because I feel like it was weird. And it was not like a cool hallucination. I just felt I was like, I feel like I'm losing my mind. <laughs> but I think, yeah, the lack of sleep and all the weird food you're eating, like the goos and stuff. Yeah. They're not good. That's not good for yeah. you. I mean, like, yeah, generally it's kind of like a fun, a fun thing. This last one for me though, like you were just saying, like you were hearing things. I had never hallucinated with hearing things. <clears throat> and this time my hallucination around hearing, and I don't know if, you know, if some medical professionals listening and can make sense of it. Like I was, I was hearing more things like families talking, like vivid conversations near me when I was all alone. Like it was creeping me out. And then I'd see That's families. Like, I was going to say, was I that at family, night? Like, I feel like I wouldn't be able to finish if that was at night. I'd be like the ghost. It was during, it me. was <laughs> during the, the, the light of day, thankfully, most of the, yeah, these voices, that is nice. but then it was like a fan. I saw, you know, I see vividly off to my right at one point, I, I saw a, f- uh, a husband and wife fashioning a canoe out of a tree with the kids running around them playing in the house behind them. And I'm like, okay, that one's real. That's so vivid. That's definitely real. And I could hear the sounds and the sounds matched what I was seeing. And then I get to it and it's like, wow, just like a pile of trees. I'm like, oh, my, I, this, I need this to stop. Like I, I help someone help me. That is <laughs> but crazy. Those now, are some yeah, good. So I'm, I'm glad that you didn't never go been in UTMB. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know what I, I, I must've done something like, wrong. I feel like there was my too much going on. Yeah. I just, I well, think me, so, the problem is oh, you just ahead. never know. I was going to say, I think the problem is you just never know. Every race is so different and you just don't know how your body's going to respond. No matter how much training you've done, it just, yeah. you're like, yeah. what, what's going to happen today? It's so fun. I have no idea. Everything, yeah. it's just a new plan that you have to think through of how I'm going to solve this. Yeah. So I want you to, before you take me to your, your finish, cause I want to hear like, I've kind of avoided letting you go into the finish because I want to really spend some time on what that must've felt like before, before that though, I want to hear, um, just, you know, broad strokes. How did you, your life as an ultra runner, how did, what, what got you to UTMB specifically and, and kind of where did it start for you? Was it a, a, a trail marathon, a 50 K like, Kind of give me the high level to what led you to that starting line of UTMB. So I feel like I have a really unique journey to UTMB. So we, my husband and I got married in Chamonix and we usually ski over there every single winter. And we, on our one year anniversary, went over there and we got married in September, but we were there like a couple weeks early and happened to be there for the start of UTMB. I had never heard about oh, wow. this race. I actually, at the time, was training for, like, my first road marathon. I did a lot of yeah. half marathons up to that. You know, I was like, okay, I'm going to jump up to the road marathon. And yeah. we were there, and it was pouring rain. And people are lined mm. up. All the runners are at the start line. You know, they're getting rained on, and they're just waiting for it to start with all their gear. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen and I mean, I was training for my first marathon. I'm like, how does one do a hundred miles and like trail running? You know, it's so different, you know, especially when you're on the road, you're like, I want the flat, flattest course. So then, um, you know, did some marathons and, you know, went back to Chamonix a couple more times. And then we were thinking, you know, like, I feel like we could do the little one, the 50 K, you know, I've done a couple marathons. That doesn't seem crazy. So we started this and they changed the system a couple of times. So we started looking at races to get points to do um, mm-hmm. the 50K. And then I got pregnant, had my second baby in 2019, and then wanted to train for another marathon. And then COVID hit. So I was training for this road marathon all summer that got canceled. And then we had some mm-hmm. friends that were also trying to get points for UTMB. And they're like, hey, you should come down to Zion. And I ran the 100K for the Zion race 
but they moved oh, okay. it to, I think it was August or September because it was during the COVID. Yep. Yeah. And they're like, you can totally do it. I was like, I've been training for a marathon. Like, you know, people walk, you can stop at the aid stations. I had never done any real trail race before this. So I went down and miraculously finished. There was a lot of suffering the last like 10 miles. I had like my feet blistered. Um, mm-hmm. So then got the points and then ran the OCC, which is the 50K, the same mm-hmm. like week as the UTMB. All the races are the same week. And then, yeah. you know, did it. And I was like, that was good. Like I got to the finish line and all the UTMB races finish in the same spot, which is cool. You know, it doesn't matter mm-hmm. what distance. Yeah. The unique thing about UTMB is that it starts and finishes there in Chamonix. But then, you know, a couple a couple weeks passed and I was like, you know, I think I could do the 100K. Like, I don't want to just stop at the 50K. I'm never going to do UTMB. That yeah. seems way too crazy, but yeah, I can do 100K. So absurd. then the next yeah. year went back. <laughs> yeah, did the 100K, did pretty well. You know, I got a running coach by that time because I was like, I don't know how to train for like a 100K race with all this elevation. Um, so I went back into the 100K. And I remember after I, the 100K is like 62 miles thinking, mm-hmm. I will never do UTMB. I'm not going to do it. I have no (laughs) desire to go 40 more miles. Like I, I feel like I've seen the course. I've done those last three climbs now twice. I have literally no desire to do them again and enough time passes. And then it's hard because you have the points and you have to earn the points. And now they have this whole system with like running stones. And so you kind of get to this point where you're like, well, they're going to expire. And if I don't use them and I'll never be here again or, you know, like maybe I won't be ready to do this again because it's just a very unique kind of training for those like really steep mountain races. Yeah. And then, you know, the registration comes along and I'm like, I don't know if I want to do it. And we actually have neighbors that ran UTMB, interestingly enough, in 2014. We didn't know them at the time. So they were at the start line in the oh. pouring rain the year that like we saw them. So all oh, these full circle that's moments. Interesting. Yeah. And they kind of taught, they're like, you have to do it. You know, the energy, it's, it's different. It's very different from the other races. They're like, you have it. And so they kind of talked me into it. And then, which I'm so glad. I'm so thankful I did it. But I think, I mean, yeah. you probably felt this way after your ultra your 100k or your 100 mile in Zion where it's like there's a couple days after where you're like I just never want to do that again like I didn't feel yeah, that yeah, great yeah, yeah, yeah. I was suffering and then enough time passes and you're like that was amazing I gotta, I gotta do it again I gotta do it again <laughs> I gotta do it again so yeah that was yeah. kind of like I feel now I'm like okay did the 50k the 100k the 100 mile like I've tapped out I did all the races but I'm off, I'm not going back this year I would like to go back at some point I do think Mm -hmm. the energy, I mean, it it was so incredible to be at the start line. It feels so surreal. And they have this very specific, unique theme song, you know, and they play it and just everyone around you is crying and emotional. And you're just like, we're all here and all of us just train so hard and I don't know what's going to happen. You know, hopefully I finish. I don't know if I will, but we made it. We made it to the start line and like, Yes. You hope you finish, but you're like, yes. this is just as good almost. Like you just feel this huge sense yes. of accomplishment and you're like, I'm about to do something amazing and I get to see the scene and just, you know, fun because we got married there and mm-hmm. right where the start line and finish line is, you know, kind of in front of that church. Like when we got mm-hmm. married there, we got married in the mountains, but we walked around town and took pictures and we have a picture like right there where the start and finish line is in like my wedding dress. And it's just like, Chill, you oh, know, just wow. all these moments where you're like, oh my gosh, like I'm here, I'm doing it. Yes. And it was also yes. our 10 year wedding anniversary in September, you know, so just a really cool, unique wow. experience. That's awesome. Fun to be there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't want to glaze over something mm-hmm. that you said that I, I say f- from time to time, but just so important. And that is that the starting line is a form of finish line. Like, I love that Absolutely. Starting line because I feel like I've done the work, like I'm confident enough to be there. And that, you know, this, from this West Texas kid, you know, where running's not a big thing where, you know, maybe physical goals period are just not a big thing. And here I am at this hundred miler, maybe I'm going to get it. Maybe I'm not, but just to just be there. That is a, that is one of the two finish lines I want. I also want the real finish line. Yeah. The starting line is a finish line. That is such a powerful spot to be. Yeah, I 
you know, I tried to take one. That was one of the rarest moments that I did actually pull out my <laughs> phone, phone and try to take some videos and pictures. But it's funny how often I think about the starting line and there's just yeah. such like a unity among everybody. Cause you're, you're like, we all suffered and ran yes. and did all the things to be here. And like, I hope all of us can finish and yeah, yeah the music and, you know, UTMB has, um, the founders were there, you know, and they gave this speech and you're like, mm. ah, it's such the mom and pop values are still there, even though it's kind of now turned into this massive race, but yeah. I don't know, you just feel connected to the people and the place and all the spectators. I mean, the streets for the first eight miles and even longer, once you get into mountain are just lined with people, you know, everybody is out there. It's a huge deal for the town and I don't know. I think it's hard to get that in other races, not saying it's other races aren't as cool. And like, I've done a lot of smaller grassroots race, which I love for different reasons, but just, yeah, yeah. I would love to go back and just experience that again someday. I don't know when that will be, but hopefully someday. Okay. So let's kind of, let's land the plane here. Everything full circle because you not only were at the first finish line, which is the starting line, you actually made it to the finish line as well. Yes. So thankfully, (laughs) so yeah. So from that, some, so from Flagera, you could see it, you were four miles away and I get that. Like for me, my version mm-hmm. of that was at Zion was two miles away and it was like, okay, I'm, I'm there. And then that two miles, you know, felt like forever. I can only imagine after what you had just done there, four miles from Flagera coming down, but then it's like, Hey, I, I'm there, but I'm not really there. I'm there, but I'm not really there. Take me into that moment where you were yeah. there and you were really there and you I know you come around the bend, so you really only see it for like the last like 16th of a mile, like the true, true finish line. But where was the mm-hmm. moment that you knew you were there and you felt like you were there? You know what I mean? And like, what, what, what was that like? Yeah. So there is a little bit before you get into the heart of town, you're kind of running along this river and there's, um, there's some spectators there, but you can see mm-hmm. the buildings of town and you know that you're going to cross this street up there, not the stair street thankfully. Um, and you, I don't know, like you can just like see, and it's also close to like where you pick up your bib, which I don't know, just like feels like, Oh my gosh, two days ago I was picking up my bib and now I'm running past this. Yes, I'm going to see the finish line. Like I know my husband and kids are there and we have a lot of friends that live in France or French, you know, so they're there. And right as I get into town, one of our really good French friends, he was waiting for me right before you kind of make that turn and he was there and he's like you did it he was like oh my gosh i'm tearing up this is so dumb (laughs) he was like josh is around the corner and so you just like run and i like we had a very specific spot where like i was gonna stop and like my kids were there and my niece flew in like for the weekend as a surprise and you just yeah it's funny because I actually did not cry at the finish line like i thought i was going to i was like i'm i think yeah you're just really spent at that point which is weird because you're like but I did it yeah but just like seeing my kids and then they are announcing your name and your number and you're I don't know you're just like it doesn't feel real you're just like I I don't feel like I'm here I'm trying to be but I don't know it's yeah one of those moments that you just want to relive over and over and I think the fun thing about ultras too is you have to work so hard to get to that finish line I mean you know Mm -hmm. it's like all the suffering, all the pain, all like the internal dialogue. You're like, should I quit? Should I not quit? Is this worth it? And you see, and you're like, it was worth it. And I earned every single step of that. And I think that Mm -hmm. is such a cool experience and something that no one can ever take away from you. You know, we can lose houses, car, you know, grow old, but it's like, those experiences are the moments like, this is my moment, my experience, and it's mine to keep forever. You, which I think I is that. so cool. I, and I'm with you. So, like I want, so of, my, of my 200 mile finishes, both, both times I wanted them to mean more to me in the exact moment. Uh, they, I mean, looking back, they mm-hmm. mean so much to me. I wanted them, I wanted to be able to cry in the moment. Like as I visualized the, the finish line in the race, you know, the months leading up to it, I wanted to have this like moment where I'm crossing and it means so much to me, but it just rubbed so raw in inability to feel good or bad that it just 
And and on some levels, I think this purity is nice. It just is. It just it just was. Like I was there. Mm-hmm. Of, of course, I I felt a sense of and a weight of what I did, but I I had no emotions left. Like I I had literally. I mean, I was second from last of this race. I literally left everything on the on the trail. And by the time I got to this finish line, where I wanted to have this really really present moment emotionally, I was dead on the inside. And looking back, that I'm so stoked on that. Yeah. But in the moment, I just kind of wanted it to be a little bit more than what it, what I what it was. I just didn't have it to give. Yeah, I do think, like you said, you just leave it all out there and you, you know, you should feel accomplished. You know, you want those feelings, but also you're just like, yeah, like you said, rub draw. Like I have nothing else to give. I'm so glad I did this, but yeah, I'm not like crying at the finish, you know? Right. Which, yeah. Which yeah. is interesting. Yeah. I yeah. thought it would be a more emotional than it was like now looking back, I feel like it's more emotional and understanding. And like, it also, I think takes several weeks and even longer to just process everything that happens during these long races. And I don't think mm-hmm. we've processed yeah, everything right. by the time we cross the finish line. And so you're, you're just right. like, you're dazed a little bit. You're like, yes. wow, I did it. But yeah, it's like you <laughs> I'm just, packing a lot like back you... in my brain for a moment. It, it's like you've just, uh, I, I equate it to like a boxing match, like where you you just got the crap kicked out of you, but you, but you didn't get knocked down. And then it comes to like a decision in the end where it's like the refs make the decision. Well, you're like, like you're still seeing like birds flying around your head and you're still completely out of it, but you won the match. Like you, you won the fight. It yeah. feels a little bit like that. It's like, oh my God, like, yeah, I'm barely, I'm stumbling around here. And I, I, uh, I, I finished. I don't, I'm not even fully aware of where right. I am right now, but this is, I'm going to love this later. Yeah, exactly. And it is the nice thing about UTMB because it is such a big race. They record you coming across the finish line oh, and they also record great. you going into all the aid stations, which is kind of fun to watch. Like towards oh. the end, you're like, wow, I was like very, you can tell I'm like. suffering <laughs> when I'm walking into that aid station, <laughs> but I'm they have, and they have it in a couple yeah, I'm great. can't believe I made it at how bad I look right there. But um, <laughs> so it's nice because you like I have people recording it, but then you have like the video and they there's like a UTMB profile or whatever you log on onto line and you can like get all the videos. So it's fun to like oh, watch that really and hear cool. your name and relive it from that standpoint. Yeah. But yeah, it is. It's an interesting the whole experience is so interesting in the moment, you know, looking back. There are two different experiences. There's the moment experience and then looking back and reflecting on everything that you went through experience. Yeah. And they're both fine. Okay. Well, perhaps the most important question in, in uh, UTMB, do you get a belt buckle? No, you get a vest. <laughs> a vest? Like a, a vest. And this is like, Girl you, Scout, it's like Boy a Boy Scout vest? Just like a fleece vest. And it says UTMB oh. finisher. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's like, it's yeah. not like a like the masters, like a green jacket that someone maybe won't ever wear unless they're trying to flex. Like it's something that you might wear every day, like day in and day out. No, I'll have to send you a picture. Um, (laughs) well, it depends (laughs) on the colors. Like my, this year was dark blue and I did wear a couple of times, like skiing, but it's not something you would just normally wear around. I wanted something more different, I guess, like a metal or a buckle, but yeah. I don't, I should look into, I don't know the history of the vests, but yeah, they just give you the vest, which, but at the moment, you know, you put on your vest and you're like, I yeah, will wear this, this is vest the coolest every thing day ever. for six yeah. months. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's a, there's a place, uh, that where, I, where I make some belt buckles for Borderlands that are like, you know, novelty, funny belt buckles, but called Molly's, uh, custom silver. You I'm can make yourself a belt a buckle that says, a- absolutely. I mean, of all the things that like, I'm t- like from it's a cultural sure. standpoint, I want to embrace what's happening in other parts of the world. And I want to go have really unique experiences. However, if I'm going to run a hundred mile anywhere and finish, I do want a belt buckle. That's a, I'll just be full on American. Or a medal or something more. Yeah, 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 sure. You know, I don't know why, why are we that way? Like, why isn't the finishing Hmm. enough? But it's like, that's a, that's a good question. Weight, the weight of it matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is interesting. But yeah, maybe I'll have to get one made for myself. If you yeah. see me around town with my UTMB belt buckle on, you'll know it was your influence. <laughs> I, love it. I love it. Well, Amanda, congratulations on finishing, and thanks for telling us about the race. Thank I think you. It's, uh, like I started with, like it's it's a race that we all know of, and some people uh, aren't crazy about it right now. But I think you know th- those of us who are 
you know, just kind of like bucket list type runners. Uh, it's still on my bucket list. I still want to go get that done at some point. Or I mean, at, but I'd honestly be content with the OCC yeah. or the CCC. So the just that's what you say now. On doing it, that's and, what and you demystifying say now. It. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> great point. Well, hey, thank you so fun. much for it's doing this. It's fun to relive this. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah, well, great job. Well, thank you. Take care. Bye. It's too late.